rights didn't write your resume, but civil rights made somebody read your resume. I'd like you to get on your feet at home, put your hands together for the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. 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 Fist bump the person next to you. Tell them you love them. National Action Network Change Ensemble. Give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. Certainly, we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally. For you that are here live at the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. And for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York, we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning to give our report on where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. And certainly we enjoyed that inspirational message from our own sister, Reverend Elder Timothy Figueroa. She tuned up here, she sang and then tuned up. I started to call her daddy. I started to call and said, we meet associates, she ready to be the bishop right now. And that was a message that we need in the middle of this, a lot of folks are uh, ignoring the impact of this pandemic mentally on people. And we act as though you can shut down for a year and it don't affect you. All life as we've known it has been off base for a year. And don't act like that's normal. One of the things I, I was saying uh, this week to some of the government officials, Timothy, is that when we are talking about reopening schools, you have had young people that have been out of school, many of them living in areas that are broadband deserts so they can't go online, many of them having no regulated behavior then now all of a sudden they're gonna go back in school. In our communities, they were already two or three years behind in math and sciences. Now they're another year behind, and you expect them to go back in without any trauma and without any reaction. There's something crazy about you not thinking that there's something gonna be different. 
Cook up be something different about you. You ain't been to a restaurant in a year. You haven't been to a movie in a year. You haven't been in a lot of things. You've been sitting up home mostly and trying to discover what it is to not have all those things. One of the things that I think people should do is evaluate that in this year of lockdown, let out, lockdown, modify, is that you should have found out that a lot of stuff you thought you had to have in life you don't need. You know, the first month or two, a lot of us was kind of like concerned. I can't hang out with my buddies. I can't go to my regular spots. But after three or four months, a lot of folk that I wasn't seeing, I found out I didn't need to see them nohow. <laughs> A lot of folk, when COVID is over, I'm over with them. Because a lot of things are habit rather than necessary. So, I'm going to leave that alone. I don't want to get nobody in trouble. But I thought her message was timely. And I thought that it is something that we need. Because a lot of us are coming through a lot without realizing what we're coming through. The other thing that I think we need to deal with is that we have lost 525 million people. And just all of that death affects us. People have lost loved ones that were not sick until this virus. And we should be very mindful of the impact of lo losing mass life like that. So give uh, Elder Figueroa another hand. <laughs> One also said we're glad to have Brother Tony Wayford in the house. Give him a hand, he brought us. He brought us it, it, with an impact on what's going on nationally around uh, the Wellness Center and I Choose Life Wellness Center. And he was the founder of our Los Angeles chapter. Give a hand, we are now, give a hand our impact television family journalist. He founded our Los Angeles chap chapter uh, of National Action Network, been with us for many years and focused a lot on the HIV AIDS problem when it began as an epidemic and then now is dealing in the pandemic. And what, one of the things I was saying to uh, some of them that are with us, with Deborah Frazier House and others, is that many of us that have been out here long enough remember when there were those in the black community that denied HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. They didn't just start denying coronavirus. They started with HIV AIDS. Said it didn't exist. Then they said it was a trick. Then they said don't take the med medication. We went through the same stages with HIV that we went through with coronavirus. And just some of us are just into natural justified concerns, because we have been guinea pigs. But then others of us are more spooky than we are scientific. Then between being spooky and being scientific. Some of y'all more spooky than y'all all saved and sanctified. Some of y'all ain't got the Holy Ghost, some of y'all got a spook. Get up in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom, and walk into the wall rather than the door and talk about God spoke to you. No, you just was stumbling in the dark, that's all. God ain't told you to hit your head upside the wall. You were asleep walking in the dark. But that spooky thing in you make everything a revelation. That's why you got to really try the spirit by the spirit. Everything ain't God talking to you. Some of that is your own mess. And I believe that we need to be real clear about that. 
So I'm glad that Tony was here. And then I certainly am uh, glad that the women's auxiliary had as their speaker this uh, week, the First Lady Charlene McCray, First Lady of the City of New York. And uh, it is clear to me that the work around mental health in our community is necessary and is of a serious problem. There are people right in our own families, people right in our own circles, people right in our own space that have mental health problems that we should not look down on, we should try and help to service them. If you live under the pressure and stress of being black in America, mental health issues are real and are in many ways more than we want to admit. That's right. You're not helping your child if your child has a mental health problem and you won't deal with it. Because they can't be healed and they can't be remedied. And denial is only to exacerbate it rather than help it. So I was glad that they had the wisdom of having her here during Women History Month. Give her a hand, the first lady. Let me say that uh, today, a year ago, is when Breonna Taylor was killed in her own home by policemen that barged in looking for the wrong person. And as they barged in her home and killed her, looking for the wrong person, it was clear that there was a crime and they have not gone forward to deal with the criminal justice system in a way that would be fair and just. We stand with that family then as we stand with the family now and that they, as far as we are concerned, should be able to get justice. And let's give a hand to her mother and those that continue to fight. Yesterday, the city of Louisville, Kentucky, settled a civil suit with the George Floyd family. And uh, I've been talking to them all week. We knew the settlement was coming. And uh, they settled for $27 million, a record settlement. But as they said, no amount of money can be in the way of them getting justice. You can't pay us to kill us. We want to see the trial and justice for a man to put his knee on your neck for almost nine minutes is to seek justice. And we want to see justice. As they are now picking the jury in Minneapolis, when the trial starts, we will certainly be there and be part of that. But we want to know, want people to understand, when you hear a settlement, they didn't settle the criminal case. They settled a civil case. We want justice. The, the, the whole question of our seeking justice is something that we've done historically, because you've got right in, in, in built into the thread, in the DNA of this country, is racism. I, I was reading uh, David Blight's book, uh, on Frederick Douglass. I read it when it first came out. I was rereading it this week. Show you how uh, even the, the church, the white church, would uh, give this whole sanctifying of racism. They would not allow blacks in their churches. One of the most corrupt things is that those that claim to be of God that would then have God's children divided based on white supremacy. And when Frederick Douglass had 
escaped from slavery and went to Massachusetts and was in New Bedford. Said he went to, uh, there was a church that allowed the blacks and the whites to have communion together. And the white was so upset that when the minister served the black woman communion, the next woman behind her, the white woman, fell out like she was in a trance. And when she came to, they asked her, what happened? She says, I, I went somewhere and I, I went to heaven. And they said, you went to heaven? She says, yes. As I fell out, I was taken on a trip to heaven. And they said, well, what was heaven like? She said, oh, it was beautiful. I saw the angels. I saw the choir singing. Nothing but everything you could imagine heaven to be streets paved with gold. I saw everything and stood with everything. And one lady that was there because the communion had just been served to a black woman said, well, did you see any blacks in heaven? She said, no, I didn't look in the kitchen. This is in the church. She told this story. This woman just come out of trance, thought she was in heaven, but still was a racist. Yeah. Martin Luther King used to say the most segregated hour in this nation is Sunday morning. Yeah. Say that again. The most segregated hour is Sunday morning. So we must challenge this false worship of God where they see God only in supremacist eyes. You can't be a racist and a Christian at the same time. As we look at what is going on in as we look at what is going on in this country that we are fighting for and dealing with, we are, we are dealing with the aftermath of what is going on in our country in terms of this COVID-19 situation. The question becomes, as now that they've got the COVID-19 uh, relief bill through, one of the things that we fought for is that we could get more money and that it comes into areas that matter and that have been underserved. I give credit to the Biden-Harris administration for getting the bill through. When you look at the contrast between what happened under the last administration and what happened now, the contrast is clear. That we are dealing with people that have no concern, that are replaced with people that at least hear the demands of the people. Now you've got even some of those that work for Trump saying that if he had only listened, you may not have had 525,000 dead. And now you've got a situation where as they vaccinate Americans and that the numbers go down, it is easy for people that are not suffering to analyze how suffering people need to act. It's easy for people that are not under duress to tell people that are under duress how to act. But those of us that are on the ground and understand the pain need to deal with the pain and need to deal with how we alleviate the pain and not get caught up in the craziness. So I'm glad to see them pass that bill and we need to move on further in terms of dealing with where we are. Do you know that the, the issue for me is you can't heal if you're going to ignore 
where the people are most hurt. There was disproportionate impact in the black community. Therefore, there must be disproportionate investment in the black community. And that is not what uh, uh, one of these senators went off and, 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 and disparaged it. That is not for disparaging. That is justice. And that is fairness. So I think that that bill is, is something that was important. But now we've got to go on from there and deal with the voting bills and deal with the bills around uh, Floyd, George Floyd and policing. We have a legislative agenda that must be dealt with. And unless we can have demonstration and legislation, we cannot have anything. And that is why we're moving forward. Change comes as you legislate what your fight for change is so that it becomes permanent. When I look at the fact as they picked this trial with George Floyd. When I look at the fact that you look at this tape that has been brought back now because of the trial, eight minutes, 46 seconds. One of the reasons why uh, when, in, when I did the eulogy, Timothy, that I had people stand up is that you can't stand on your feet eight minutes and 46 seconds without fidgeting. I mean, think about it. You stand up right now, eight minutes and 46 seconds, you're going to move, you're going to fidget. You can't stand still eight minutes and 46 seconds. So imagine the kind of hate and venom that someone had to press their knee on somebody that long while their neck is throbbing and while they're begging for their life. It takes a lot of hate and venom in order to keep your knee on someone's neck that long. I mean, at what point do you have it turned from, even if it was anger, that it turns from willful intent? And willful intent is a crime. So that is why I said, yes, they had the settlement, but they need to now deal with justice in the courts. This man has committed a crime, and we want justice. But had there not been people that went to the streets and fought and stood up, there wouldn't even be a trial. If there hadn't been a video with that young lady that was walking by, it wouldn't have been a trial. How many people that are not video have been treated in the same way? And that's why we can't stop. That's why people, you know, people talk about God wrote a book on the boomers generation. I'm a boomer. I told him, no, I'm a warrior. I don't know what kind of boomer is. I'm a warrior. I fight in my generation. And every generation has to fight until the fight is no longer necessary to fight. I, I, I keep hearing the people say that there was the Moses generation, Joshua generation. I thought about that the other day when last uh, Sunday was the anniversary of Selma. And I thought about how, uh, I think it was 2007, that uh, Barack Obama was getting ready to run for president the next year. And he spoke about how Dr. King and John Lewis and Reverend Jackson and all, Moses generation, and now is the Joshua generation. And a lot of our young people talk about that today. But the question that I raise today, I want y'all to think about this, is you cannot call yourself a generation that you're not qualified to fulfill. 
I'm going to say that again slow. You can't call yourself something that you're not qualified to fulfill. You can't call yourself Moses or Joshua unless you are qualified to become the Moses and Joshua. Joshua didn't just get to be next. Joshua had to go through some training and preparation and sacrifice in order to be Joshua. Just like Moses did. Too many people want to be exalted without being prepared and without sacrificing and disciplining themselves to be that. So you want to be a star rather than be a leader. In between somebody that's a star and somebody that's a leader. Star, you get yourself a Facebook page, Instagram page, TikTok, and just look at yourself all day long. Never get tired of looking at yourself. You can look at yourself live. Just get your little smartphone, lay back, and just keep looking at yourself. Get tired, put it down, want to see some more, look at yourself some more. That's starving. Get you four or five followers, and you think you're a star. But you're not leading anybody because you're not leading them somewhere to address what needs to be addressed. When we are dealing with Joshua, Joshua came out of the movement of Moses. Let's go to the book. Joshua was a young man that went through the struggle of the Exodus. Am I right? And when Moses had sent Caleb and others and said, I want you to go and survey the promised land, Joshua was the young man with Caleb that went to survey the land. When they came back to give Moses the report, Joshua was with Caleb because the others said we can't take the land. Because to us they appeared as giants. And to us we appeared as frogs. As grasshoppers, not frogs, as grasshoppers. Now they weren't giants. And the Israelites weren't grasshoppers. But they had a grasshopper complex. You can't be Joshua with a grasshopper complex. And the problem that many of us have is that we have grasshopper complexes. We accept what others give us and make us have because we look at them as giants and us as just grasshoppers. So that's why you live in a city that has the captains of industry on Wall Street. And you don't question why the wealth is not distributed fairly. Because you've got a grasshopper complex. You live in Harlem, or Bed-Stuy, or Brownsville, or East New York, all your life and let folk come and run you out the neighborhood with gentrification because you got a grasshopper complex. You allow people to have health facilities financed by taxpayer dollars and you wonder why there are health deserts in our community and you don't question it because you got a grasshopper complex. And then when somebody comes and questions it, you turn on them rather than turn on the folks they question. Don't forget now, it takes a lot to be a Moses or a Joshua. 
Moses, let me let me tell you where I'm getting with this, because I keep meeting people that want the profile, but don't want to do the work. Moses was in Pharaoh's house. You in the president's house. That's what Pharaoh was. Pharaoh was the head of state. When Moses found out who he was, when he found out he was not Egyptian, he was an Israelite, he went to reconcile with his own. Ended up killing a man who was part of the oppressor. First thing is, if you're not willing to go and be with where God puts you, you're not qualified to be Joshua. Right. Too many of us try to live and be something that we're not. I, I never did. I was talking to some people last week when Vernon Jordan died. One of the great parts of Vernon Jordan is that he would get in big corporations and never forget why he was there. He'd be on the board. He would try to open doors for black businesses, open doors for black promotion. A lot of folk get a halfway promotion and act like they ain't one of us no more. A lot of us get feel complimented when somebody says you're not like the rest of them. You ought to be insulted. The rest of who? But you got the only black concept. I'm the only one in my neighborhood. I'm the only one on my job. Moses rejected that and left Pharaoh. Then he ended up, after he killed a man, he ended up going out into finding this God of the Israelites. That's how he met his wife and her father. And then when God assigned him to lead the liberation struggle, I know a lot of y'all too holy talk about liberation, but that's what an exodus is. An exodus from slavery is a liberation struggle. That's why all these preachers, Elder Figueroa talk about, I don't know what Sharpton and them doing, they need to read the Bible. God was always on the side of those that would fight against oppression. Now, when he went back to fight, I want to break this down clinically for you. God never gave anybody an easy battle to victory. You got to ask yourself, Tony, why didn't God just tell Moses, go back and tell Pharaoh to let people go and just wipe Pharaoh out. That's right. Why did God say, I'm going to put seven plagues on? Because people need to struggle to get to where liberation becomes something that they have earned in the fight for liberation. You need to be dealt with in your discipline. You need to get the envy of being an oppressor yourself out of you. You need to go through stages of learning how to be a liberator. So it took seven plagues before they were even let go. And even then, when it got to the banks of the Red Sea, they turned on Moses. Now imagine Moses. I got to go through this seven times. Go through Pharaoh seven times. Go through every one of the plagues seven times. Go through seven times. Folks saying, I told y'all this ain't going to be nothing. I told y'all he ain't going to get us free. Imagine all that, the backbiting and the criticizing. I told y'all this ain't nothing. Finally, when the death angel comes and they free the Israelites, they grumbling all the way out of slavery. If you can't take the grumbling, if you can't take those that are doubters, if you can't take the backbiting, you ain't qualified. If everybody got to be on your side in order for you to take a stand, 
then you're not qualified. If everybody got to be in your amen corner, if everybody got to be in your cheering squad, you are not qualified. They're at the banks of the Red Sea. These are folks that saw seven plagues, seven miracles. First thing they did was turn on Moses. What you brought us out here to die. Call him an agent for Pharaoh. Hello. But Moses, if you're going to qualify to be a Moses, or a Joshua. You can't hear the crowd. You got to hear the God that sent you to free the crowd that's criticizing you. One of the hardest jobs, Gwen Carr, is to fight for folks that's mumbling and grumbling against you while you're fighting for them. You're fighting for, to free people that is against you. Y'all know the story of this woman history month, Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was fighting the free slaves that would challenge her that wouldn't challenge the slave master. Slave master gave an order, they obeyed. Harriet Tubman said, let's go. Why? Who you, where you taking us? Who made you the leader? This don't make no sense. Grumbling to freedom. Martin Luther King led the Montgomery bus boycott, broke down segregation in the South, led all the way to the Civil Rights Act. Until the day he died, blacks called him names. Too soft, sell out, Uncle Tom. Till he died, shouldn't be up in the pulpit. He more in the politics than the God. Till he died, man blew his brains out. And the same critics now have Martin Luther King Day. Same preachers wouldn't let him in their church. Got his picture up on the wall. If you won't be Moses, you got to be willing to deal with all of that. That's why Jesus said, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross. He didn't say pick up your crown. Pick up your cross. You're going to suffer some to follow me. You're going to be nailed to the cross. You're going to be betrayed by your loved ones. You're going to be questioned by those that you help. But if you can do that for my sake, then I will reward you. But you got to earn the reward. Even after they opened up the Red Sea and the children of Israel marched across the Red Sea, even then, when they got in the wilderness, they still turned it back. Imagine you done brought people through seven plagues, walked them through a river in dry land, and you go up to get the Ten Commandments and come back and they partying and twerking all over the wilderness. <laughs> You up there, knowing that you liberated these people, getting the commandments to govern a new nation, and you come back down, and they doing the boogie woogie, and twerking with thongs on in the wilderness. Well, that's about what some of y'all doing. Turning the doors that we open in the jokes. Turning the options open in the ridicule. Like people fought and died for you. For you to insult and embarrass your own heritage. I've looked at some of these shows, 
I remember when Diane Carroll just died recently. Dominique Nash is part of the Daughters of the Movement with her daughter. I remember when Diane Carroll went on television with the sitcom Julia yeah. when I was a little boy. And it was a major achievement for a black woman to be on TV with a show. Some of y'all old enough to remember that. Before Diane Carroll, they had Emperor Waters on with Beulah, had to play a maid. But Diane Carroll was a medical worker, a nurse, dignity, showed our refinement. And she suffered insults. She suffered all kind of negligence and abuse. To open the door for people to cut down on TV and all they're going to do is cuss each other out and tell each other's business and snatch each other's weeds out their head. Wilderness behavior. We fought to get the right to vote. Vote and put blacks in high office. And you sit up in high office selling out your community for your own favor and then you get busted and want people to stand up for you when you misuse us wilderness behavior they got in the wilderness and turned their back on the values and the principles that God had, uh, had given them that's why you can't get to the promised land without the ten commandments and my real thought to you today is you can't get free unless you return to the values and discipline that your elders had imparted you before you got all crazed with trying to be something that you're not. They're principles that come out of our people. And unless we abide by those principles and quit imitate riotous living, we will end up continuing to go in circles. Barack Obama won in 08. Some of us went crazy. Got a black president now. We ain't got to fight no more. All of that's yesterday. Post Rachel. And what happened right behind Obama? You get a Donald Trump. <laughs> Because you thought it was over. And you gave up the fight. Rather than continue to fight. And then you fight each other. Everybody that stand up, you could try to find fault with them. You're looking for mess. If you can't find none, you'll create some. So Moses comes down and loses, loses his head mad angry, hurt, seeing these people acting like this in the wilderness. And Joshua then comes from the ranks to lead them on. But Joshua had to see and bear all of the pain that Moses had and was prepared to be Joshua. And God said, I will salute Moses. Moses the only one we don't know where, where Moses was buried. Look at the book. They say that God said, I'll bury Moses. Well, why, why, why did God not allow them to bury Moses? Because God didn't want them trapped up in the cemetery, running around the monument, praising Moses, rather than heading on to the promised land. Some of y'all never left the graveyard of the person that you should have done what they taught you, rather than getting caught up with the teacher. That's the problem. Some of y'all went to school and fell in love with the teacher and never fell in love with the lesson. I had a friend of mine. Man, I got a cute, fine Spanish teacher. And don't know one word of Spanish. I said, where you going? Going to my Spanish class, man. I told you she fine. I said, well, come on, stop spending. He said, what do you say? He didn't know no Spanish. He in love with the teacher and missed the lesson. 
Some of y'all admire the pastor and don't listen to the sermon. Like the leader, but don't have nothing to do with the movement. That's why God said, let me bear Moses. Y'all get on to the promised land. We are at a critical time. Where as this country comes out of this pandemic, as they start to reopen this country, we cannot let it reopen and go back to normal because normal did not work for us. In these next three months, is the time for us to redefine, Joe, what normal is going to be. That's why we got to pass the George Floyd bill. That's why we got to deal with this John Lewis bill. That's why we got to win the trial in Minneapolis. We must reconstruct normal. We cannot let it go back to what it used to be. And by doing that, you can't go back to who and what you used to be. That's why I like that part in the Bible where God said, I've set you aside. I knew you. For your mother even knew you was, she was pregnant, I knew you. Before your mother ever told daddy, I'm expecting, I knew you. As you grew through your adolescent days, I knew you and I set you aside. Problem with some of you, and I'll let you go on this, is you keep wondering why you don't fit in. You don't fit in because you've been set aside. And when you've been set aside, you don't fit with the foolishness of us. <laughs> Reverend, there's something awkward about them. No, there's something set aside about them. They don't, they don't uh, do what we do. They don't vibe with us. That's right. Because when you set aside, you're on a different vibe. Right. I said in my morning meditation this morning, I've been preaching since I was four years old. I grew up different. I ain't never wanted to fit in. And too many of y'all fit in to nothing. Go along to get along. Always want to be part of the crowd. But the Bible said God set some people aside. Why does he have to set him aside? He can't talk to you if you got too many folk around you. That's one of the reasons why if you use the pandemic right, as you shut down, your crowd is gone. And that's why those that God would use, he would set aside. Well, those of us that's been set aside need to come now and help change this society. All that you looked at, a year ago today, Donald Trump was flying high. President of the United States talking trash. <laughs> tweeting every night, all night long, all kind of stuff he wanted to say. But he gone now. Yeah. I remember I was going to Baltimore to deal with a housing situation. Got off the plane, and he had tweeted all kind of stuff against me. But somewhere I read, 37 Psalms, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thy envious against the workers of iniquity, because they will soon he didn't give me the date. He didn't give me the timetable. They will soon. He didn't guarantee it to be this month or this week. They will soon be cut down. 
And I learned not to argue now like I used to when I was younger. I just wait on soon to show up. If you trust in the Lord, he'll make a way in due time. In God's own time, he will make the wicked fall right before your very eyes. We must use these times. We must use these next couple of months to fight like we never fought before, to stand like we never stood before. We can't let them, as they come back out of this pandemic, come and open up like they used to. Y'all want to open up businesses? Well, we need to understand where our role is in the business. We need to know where our positions is. We need to know where you're banking. We need to know how you're doing business. Normal don't work for us. Y'all want to reopen up Broadway? Well, let's negotiate our role on Broadway. We got black artists that you've always shut out. Ain't going to reopen unless we open in a new way. Y'all want to reopen the schools? We want the same educational resources in our community that you put in other communities. Don't open up the old norm. It's time for us to set aside and say, wait a minute, I'm not those waiting on you to hit the switch. I'm waiting on you to understand that we got to rearrange and reconstruct how we going to deal with this new norm. You want to be Joshua? Let's be qualified to be Joshua. Dr. King, all the way from King to Obama, brought us over the Red Sea, but we got one more river to cross. And this pandemic showed us that we weren't there yet. We are unequal in education. We are unequal in health care. We are unequal in wealth, black to white. We are unequal in how we deal with our social settings. We've got another river to cross. But if we use the values and the beliefs of our elders, that's why everybody in the Bible always referred to the elders before them. That's why they all went and said, I come in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because they understood that if they kept to the values that they were to have, that God would make a way out of nowhere. My mother never uh, sat in one theology class, but she had more religion than any theologian I ever met. Why? Because she believed and had faith. And faith is the key to being set aside. Faith is not what you could calculate. Faith is not what you could plan out. Faith is not the end of your strategic planning. Faith is when it don't make sense. Don't make sense. But you believe anyhow. Faith is when you can't figure it out. But you hold on anyhow. Faith is when everybody around you doubts. But you set aside and believe anyhow. That is why we made it. Faith is when the doctors give up. But you hold on believing that God is an ultimate doctor. Faith is when you got a pile of bills and no money. But you say, I don't believe God brought me this far to lead me now. He'll provide all of my needs. We come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He never, he never. He never, from the outhouse to the White House, he never failed me yet. Stand up, black man. Proclaim this day. We're going to turn this nation around. This is our time. This is our thing. Ain't going to let nobody deny us and nobody turn us around. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will stay on the battlefield until I die.